Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nora Kyle Messier, and I'm the Manager of Education and Public Programs here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. I am here to introduce the latest episode of Hidden Collections. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're a regular viewer, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. It's our custom here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum to begin all of our programs, whether we're together in person, finally, or still gathering online by taking a moment to acknowledge and pay due respect to the Wampanoag people on whose ancestral land, here known as Nabnaket on Noape, the museum stands. We recognize their millennia of stewardship, their continued presence in and contributions to our island and our community. Today on Hidden Collections, we're diving into the wide world of sports and recreation on Martha's Vineyard. Leisure time spent on the island over time has often featured physical activities like sailing and swimming, and the 1895 Marine Hospital, now the main campus of the Martha's Vineyard Museum, was the longtime home of the St. Pierre Summer Sports Camp. Some of the island's sporting pastimes, like rogue, have fallen out of fashion, while others remain popular to this day. I will turn you over to our host and ever popular research librarian, uh, Bo, uh, Bo Van Riper, in just a moment after our few standard preliminaries. Um, I'm sure Zoom has already told you that we are recording this session for posterity. And if you have any questions, please just pop them into the chat or the Q&A and we'll save time at the end to make sure we get to them. And in the meantime, I thank you for being here and let's play ball, Bo. The History of sports and recreation in general is one of those redheaded stepchildren of history. It's frequently seen as something of minimal interest, something that's really just the province of people who know the batting average of everybody who ever played for the New York Yankees or every horse who ever won the Kentucky Derby. But in point of fact, because sports and games and other forms of recreation are human activities, they are like any other human activity, part of a larger and more complicated and thus more interesting story. It's not just about who won or lost in any given contest. It's not just about batting averages and and time from the starting gun to the final tape. It's about who played, what they played, when they played, what they got out of it. And in the context of something, of some place like Martha's Vineyard, where the people playing the games included both summer visitors and year-round residents, both men and women, both the poor and the wealthy, there are an extraordinary number of interesting stories woven through the larger story of people going out in the summer sun to have a good time. So today is a look through some of the images and documents in our collections that tell the stories of people on Martha's Vineyard out having a good time. And I should note as we start that for all the, you should excuse the metaphor, bases that we're going to touch in the next hour or so, I could have done another program equally as long, touching on an entirely different set of stories. That's how rich and how largely unmined the story of sports and recreation on Martha's Vineyard is. So being that Martha's Vineyard is an island, it seems reasonable to start by talking about boats and boating, or if you prefer, yachting. Now, the difference between boating and yachting is a bit like the difference between a boat and a ship. Nobody can precisely define it but everybody has a sort of instinctive sense of what it involves. If you, the vessel in which you're going to see for recreational purposes is like the one I sail in the summer, 21 feet long, and, ha and you sit on the deck with your hindquarters 12 inches above the ocean, 
chances are you're boating or sailing, but not yachting. Um, if the concept of go below and mix a drink is something that exists within your um, within your boating repertoire, then chances are you might be a yacht person. This image from the late 1800s shows the New York Yacht Club squadron um, on its annual visit to Martha's Vineyard. The New York Yacht Club is, of course, the ultimate example of what people think of when they, when they think of yachting with a capital Y and a Thurston Howell the Third accent. The New York Yacht Club is people in white pants and build caps and navy blue blazers. The New York Yacht Club was the outfit that lifted the, the America's Cup from Britain in 1851 and successfully defended it in every subsequent contest down to the 1980s when the upstart Australians won it. And the New York Yacht Club is the ultimate example through the 19th century and well into the 20th century of yachting as a rich person's, more specifically a rich man's hobby. Those schooner yachts you see in the background there are designed to be sailed by professional crews with the owner, the rich guy who actually belongs to the yacht club, sitting on the after deck and enjoying the scenery and telling the captain where he'd like to go next. The New York Yacht Club sailed every summer up Long Island Sound, through Rhode Island Sound, into Vineyard and Nantucket Sound, pausing at interesting places along the way, including Martha's Vineyard. They paused regularly enough at Martha's Vineyard. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. that they actually built a shore station at the foot of what's now New York Avenue on the East Chop Shore. That's it there with the two flagpoles and the sign helpfully labeling it as the place where, if you're a member of the New York Yacht Club, you can come ashore. The house in the background with the big porch and the cupola still stands today at the corner of Eastville Avenue and you can drive by it as you're on your way up towards East Chop Light. The New York Yacht Club station building has long since been moved. It's now a B&B &B farther down towards the Lagoon Bridge. And the wharf it was attached to has long since been torn down. For that matter, the New York Yacht Club no longer cruises every summer as a unit, no longer calls at Vineyard Haven. But I mentioned the New York Yacht Club here to make two points. One is that this is one of the places where the role of social class in sports is most screamingly obvious. Yachting as it was in the 19th century was for the most part a rich person's enterprise, it cost enormous amounts of money to buy and maintain and pay the professional crew to run one of those big schooner yachts. And by and large, you had to be among the 1% or at least the 5% to be able to participate. But as the 20th century went on, the mass production of smaller boats like Wiano Seniors, Lightnings, Cape Cod Knockabouts, and whatnot, brought, if not yachting, then certainly recreational sailing into the hands of at least the upper middle class. By the early 20th century, if you could afford a summer house on a place, at a place like Cape Cod or Martha's Vineyard, and you were interested in sailing as a form of recreation, you could probably afford a boat to do it in, if you were so inclined. Next slide, please. We'll come back to those boats that were coming within reach of the middle class by the first half of the 20th century. But before that, I'd like to skip down to the other end of the class scale. What if you were had enough money to take a vacation? 
um, enough money to go to the vineyard for a long weekend, a week of whatnot, but you didn't have enough money to own your own vacation house with your own dock or your own mooring in front to tie your own boat up at, but you still wanted to get out on the water. If that was the case, then boat rental agencies were there for you. Next slide, please. Joseph Pina's boat rent, um, rental operation on Church's Pier in Oak Bluffs, Church's Pier being that wharf that sticks out directly opposite the deck at Nancy's Snack Bar, offered not offered the entire spectrum of boats for rent. They offered outboard motor boats, sailboats, rowboats, and as shown here, paddle boats um, with a small paddle wheel underneath the seats turned by bicycle pedal-like bicycle pedal cranks. They floated on two pontoons and would have been a horrific death trap in anything other than gentle breezes and calm seas. But the harbor at Oak Bluffs, where Pina rented his paddle boats, offered just that, almost entirely enclosed in anything but a significant storm. The waves were small, and there was relatively, there was no current and no serious danger of hitting rocks or shoals or anything else. You'll note that the two women in this picture are kitted out in ordinary street clothes, no slickers, no sou'westers, no life jackets. They just walked in off the street, climbed down on the dock and into the paddle boat and off they went, 50 cents for half an hour. Joseph Pena was not by any means the only person renting boats on Martha's Vineyard in the first half of the 20th century. The Harbor Side Inn, which was established on the shores of Edgartown Harbor in, after World War II, had its own boat fleet of sailboats for rent and a paid captain to instruct people on how to sail them. There were boat rental operations in all the Down Island harbors and in Menemsha as well. A lot of the fishermen in Edgartown, for example, would clean up their cat boats in the summer and hire themselves out for fishing charters, beach picnics, and whatnot. Want to go on a cruise on Vanity around Edgartown Harbor or out to Cape Pogue? Captain Oscar Pease was there for you. And as Quint in Jaws might have said, it beats working for a living. Next slide, please. This is a shot of Church's Pier from a postcard probably made in the 1950s Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The dock on, on the right there is in front of where Nancy's is now. And if you walk down that same dock nowadays, you'd pass the High Line Pier where the boats to Nantucket tie up on your left and the Coupe de Ville and the Sandbar on the right. In the 1950s, though, Church's Pier was a gas dock and a place for people with motorized cabin cruisers to tie up. And then on a little finger pier in the left foreground there, Joseph Pina's multicolored rowboats and on the other side of the pier, the top part of the yellow oval, those paddle boats that we saw in the advertisements, also multicolored to appear, appeal to the kind of people who'd be wandering down the streets of Oak Bluffs and think, ah, well, that might be a fun thing to do on a sunny summer afternoon and plunk down their 50 cents for an hour of paddling around Oak Bluffs Harbor. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, back at the middle class, back at the, the people who are wealthy enough to own a place on the vineyard, or at least to rent a place on the vineyard, summer in and summer out, but not wealthy at the New York Yacht Club. I have my own schooner yacht with a paid crew and captain level. For them, island boat builders in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s turned out a range of small, mostly wooden-hulled sailing craft, like the Menemsha here. 
The Menemsha was a roughly 16 or 17 foot wooden hulled sailboat capable of holding three people, simply rigged with a mainsail and a jib, designed for sheltered waters like Vineyard Haven Harbor. They were used to teach sailing lessons at the St. Pierre camp, used for a time by the Girl Scout sailing camp on the lagoon, and designed and built by Erford Burt in his shop at the foot of the hill where the Marina Hospital stands, that's now Safe Harbor Marina. Next slide, please. Erford Burt was also responsible when he worked before World War II for what's now the Martha's Vineyard Shipyard as foreman for the Vineyard Haven 15, a 21 foot closed cockpit sloop that was designed not only to race and sail in sheltered waters like Vineyard Haven Harbor, but to be able to handle the rips and tides and chops of Vineyard and Nantucket Sound. The 15s in their heyday sailed as far away as Nantucket, and New Bedford. They sailed to Nantucket for the annual regatta there, or up to up Buzzards Bay towards New Bedford in convoy accompanied by a motorboat in case anything went wrong. With a 2000 pound weight on the end of their keel and a sealed cockpit so that the water couldn't enter, water couldn't enter the hull, they were literally uncapsizable, which is a useful thing if you're sailing around out in Vineyard Sound and a sudden gust of wind hits you just the wrong way. They were called 15s despite being 21 feet overall because their water line, the line where the hull touched the water was 15 foot and boats in those days between the world wars were named more often than not for their water line length, not their overall length. Hence, next slide please. The Edgartown 15, similar in design to the Vineyard 15, but subtly different also 15 feet on the water line. The beach boat, next slide please, was like the Menemsha, a smaller, lighter boat designed for training junior sailors designed to be used in sheltered waters. Manuel Swartz Roberts of Edgartown didn't design the beach boat, although he did design any number of cat boats that summer people in Edgartown sailed for recreation, as well as designing cat boats for working fishermen like Oscar Pease of the Vanity. But he built a significant number of the beach boats that were used in the 30s and 40s as training boats by the Edgartown Yacht Club. And then, next slide please. There was the Vineyard Sound Inter Club, designed so that the yacht clubs at Edgartown, founded in 1905, Vineyard Haven, founded in 1928, and Nantucket, founded sometime, which I didn't think to look up before this talk, sorry about that, would have a single design that they could all use and so that they could race against each other on an even basis. The Vineyard Sound Inner Clubs were the biggest and fanciest of the locally built sailboat classes that existed on the island in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. They were the major leagues of local recreational sailboat racing. And the people who sailed them also cruised in them as far away as Cuddy Hunk, as far away as Block Island, as far away as the southern shores of the Cape. One of the things that all five of these designs had in common was that they were designed and built by local yards, local designers with local conditions specifically in mind. That was a characteristic of recreational sailboats up and down the East Coast during the years between the two world wars. In the aftermath of World War II, new materials like fiberglass and aluminum began to displace wood and the mass production of fiberglass hulled aluminum sparred boats 
made it possible for people to buy small recreational sailboats from large national distributors more cheaply than they could ever have bought handmade equivalents from local designers and builders between the world wars. The advent of fiberglass and aluminum, the coming of the sailfish and the sunfish, the Rhodes 19, the Soling, the 420, and all the rest of the boats that dot recreational sailing harbors nowadays basically meant the end of the era of locally boat built, locally sailed boats designed with specific local conditions in mind. Next slide, please. The interclubs had their heyday in the 30s and a brief revival in the late 40s, but were all but gone by the end of the 1950s. The last surviving Menemsha is now in a shed on the on the MV Museum property, having come to us along with the St. Pierre Camp, ex-Marine Hospital. The last of the beach boats and the last of the Edgartown 15s, the last of the Katamas, as far as we know, were broken up long ago. The Vineyard 15 still survives. Next slide, please. They were revived with fiberglass hulls by the Martha's Vineyard shipyard in the 60s. And many of the 12 fiberglass hulled 15s that were built in those days still exist, like this one, the last one, Tyke, built in 1970. And when I get her back in the water in June, still sailing in Vineyard Haven Harbor. Next slide, please. Baseball compared to boating is a much less cash intensive enterprise. As these gentlemen, part of the Edgartown Town baseball team of 1902 demonstrate, you don't even need actual consistent uniforms, just bats, balls, gloves, and a catcher's mask if the catcher wants his face to remain in the shape that he, it was in before he started the game. If you take a close look, next slide, at this particular group, you'll notice a couple of things. One, notice the gloves on the guy in the middle and the guy on the right. Gloves in 1902 were significantly smaller, significantly thinner, significantly less high tech than the gloves that even an aspiring little league player would use today. They were not much more expansive than the gloves you might wear to keep your hands warm when you were shoveling snow outside, especially the gentleman on the right there in the overalls. The second thing to call your attention to is the way in these photographs, particularly ones like this, where you're looking at a basically amateur team, the way that close signal class. The guy on the left in the back row there is wearing a silk cravat and a suit with a vest. He's clearly of a different social class, of a different stratum of society than everybody else in the photograph who were wearing various mixtures of collared and collarless shirts. The guy with the tiny little glove and the bat resting on his leg is wearing a pair of overalls. It was, a, it was characteristic of small town baseball teams in the years, the late 19th, early 20th century, that the players were almost exclusively working class young men, shop clerks, carpenters, builders, fishermen, and so on and so forth. The team might be sponsored by a well-to-do businessman who bought the equipment and paid for travel expenses and whatnot. That's almost certainly what the gentleman in the suit and tie on the left side of the photograph is doing. But by and large, baseball was, at the turn of the last century, a young man's, a young man's game 
emphasize both halves of that, a young person's game and a man's game, but also to a significant extent, a working class game. Next slide, please. This is the Vineyard Haven Town team about 1903. That is to say the same vintage as the gentleman and the priest in the preceding picture. Notice that they've got, unlike their counterparts in Edgartown, they've got actual uniforms with the team name on them. They've got matching caps. They've got matching, um, matching jerseys and pants and whatnot. And they've also got a sponsor, like the Edgartown team. That's him, the gentleman in the middle of the middle of the center row with the yachting cap and the dark suit and the tie. He's William Hammond, who ran a barber shop on Main Street, built it before the Great Fire of 1883, rebuilt it afterwards, and in doing so became Vineyard Haven's first African American business owner. He sponsored the town baseball team, was the drum major for the town band, and was, as this picture suggests, a not only well-to-do member of the business community, but a, an ex accepted member of the town social fabric, of which the town baseball team, they would, by the way, have spelled baseball, it's two words in those days, baseball, of which the town's baseball team was a part. Next slide, please. Now, with these guys, the Martha's Vineyard Heralds of 1905, we're getting into the realms of semi-professional baseball. That is to say, teams that whose players received a small stipend to represent the business or the company or whatever that funded them. These guys, as their name suggests, were funded by the Martha's Vineyard Herald newspaper, the, whose original publisher, Charles Strong, was responsible for the Civil War Memorial that's now the subject of the Chasm is Closed exhibit down in the community gallery. They would have played most likely against teams sponsored by the local hotels, by other local businesses, and by visiting semi-pro teams from the mainland or the Cape, sponsored by factories, say the Wamsuda Mills in New Bedford, or by other big resort hotels. They would have played, next slide please, most likely in Wabin Park in Oak Bluffs, to orient you, that red arrow is pointing at the old at the building that became the Seaview Hotel and then was torn down in the 80s to make way for the impressively large and architecturally undistinguished Seaview condominiums. The you're looking north across Wabin Park, and the baseball game is going on inside that green oval. You'll notice that between the camera and the baseball field, there's a tennis net set up across a grass and sand court. And you'll notice in the background where the purple arrows are pointing are an open-sided shelter and some kind of a white flat ground. Which brings us to Roke. Next slide, please. Roke, as it says up in the caption there, R-O-Q-U-E, was a game that was all the rage at Oak Bluffs in the late 19th and the early 20th century. You can see that there were at least three rope courts in this picture. We're now looking back across Wabin Park with the ocean at our backs and the Seaview Hotel to our right. The small open-sided structure we can see in the foreground there is what one of the purple arrows was pointing to. The long white rectangles behind it are the rope courts. Next slide, please. How to describe rope? Imagine playing croquet, you know, knock the ball through the wicket with a mallet, except instead of playing it on grass with a mallet whose handle is about as long as your leg. 
you're playing it on hard packed clay on a court with a rubber with a raised surround imagine you're playing croquet on top of a gigantic pool table but you're playing it with a mallet with the handle sawed off to about 15 inches long so that like this gentleman you have to either crouch down to take your shot or next slide please bend over at the waist because you if you stand up and hold the mallet at the end of your outstretched arm you're going to have a good 18 to 24 inches between the mallet and the ground where your ball is that's the new sea view hotel behind him by the way um so i said that baseball at the turn of the century was predominantly a young man's game predominantly a working man's game if you were a middle-aged white collar person unless it was in indulging your son or your grandson you likely wouldn't be out there with a glove on your hand and a bat on your shoulder on a saturday or sunday afternoon in the summer doing your thing on the diamond although you might well like the folks in that picture a few slides back be watching the young guys from the martha's vineyard herald or the harbor view or hammond's barber shop or whatever doing their thing roke on the other hand was absolutely and unquestionably a middle-class white-collar person's game. Again, entirely a man's game. Croquet might be co-ed, but Roke was all men. And not just men, but middle-class men working white-collar jobs. The Roke Club of Martha's Vineyard, which lasted astoundingly into the 40s, when at which point World War II basically put paid to it, consisted almost exclusively of clergymen, doctors, lawyers, business executives, accountants, and the like. The guy who washed dishes at the local hotel, who slung boards on the local building site, who hauled scallop dredges in Eggertown Harbor, was not going to be putting on his white shirt and, like this gentleman, his tie to go play roke on Sunday afternoon. It was billed as, quote, a more scientific form of croquet. And it had, for the people who practiced it, a kind of patina of this is a contest for the mind as well as the body. This is not just some crude physical activity where you run and jump and throw. This, this is like chess played on a grand scale. Next slide, please. For those with less august taste in rec recreation, however, there was the skating rink at Oak Bluffs. Again, to orient you, imagine you're standing um, between the flying horses on your left and the Episcopal Church and police station on your right nowadays, looking towards the Santander Bank and the Lookout Tavern beyond. That's the view in this photograph and that gigantic building that looks like the offspring of a Disneyland castle on an airship hangar was built by Frederick Winslow in the 1880s. Next slide, please. Pardon me, Frank Winslow, one of those F names. Frank Winslow built the roller skating rink on Martha's Vineyard because he recognized Cottage City, as it was called then, <coughs> as being for three months out of the year, a massive, massive community of people looking to have a good time of people who came to Martha's Vineyard with the idea of getting away from the pressures and the noise and the stress of the city, of relaxing in their hotels or their rented cottages, enjoying the sea breezes, listening to bands play, dancing the night away, and bathing in the salt water along the Oak Bluff shoreline. More about that in a bit, too. 
roller skating had for this kind of crowd a couple of significant appeals. You could do it indoors, even if the weather was not conducive to being to strolling in the park or along the plank walk atop the bluffs or bathing in the salt waters off the off the shore. You could do it with a person of the opposite sex. And because you were in public and chaperoned, not just by the people who ran the rink, but also by several hundred of your closest friends who were out skating with you, um, there was absolutely nothing about it that anybody could take exception to, including your would-be paramours, older relatives. Frank Winslow recognized that, like the proprietors of the Flying Horses recognized, that Cottage City was a great place to establish a public attraction. But Winslow had something else in mind, too. Marketing. Next slide, please. Because Winslow was a manufacturer of roller skates, and he used the vineyard roller skating rink as a venue for promoting, selling, renting his patented varieties of roller skates, which he called cashing in on the vineyard's newfound popularity as a summer resort, as a fashionable place to go, the vineyard roller skate. You can see an actual vineyard roller skate in the One Island Many Stories Gallery in the escaping case. Next slide, please. And it looks a bit like this, the Vineyard Model A. But Winslow, as this catalog from the archive shows, didn't stop there. There was a Model B, there was a Model C, and there was the Vineyard Heel Strap Club, which you'll notice, unlike the Vineyard A, has a strap around the heel, but a clamp to hold the front of your shoe to the roller skate. Or if you wanted something even more racy, next one, please, you could go with the all clamp model of the vineyard. The clamps are those sticky up bits on either side of the, of the foot plate, which after you set your shoe on top of the skate, you'd then use a skate key. Anybody remember those? To tighten the clamp so that the little jaws of the clamp close themselves over the leather sole of your shoe firmly attaching the skate to the shoe until you decided to take it off. Next slide, please. The thing about roller skating was that on the one hand, it could be a social activity in which you participated. This advertising card, for example, touts a grand costume carnival Imagine a cross between a roller skating party and a costume ball where it stoutly insists you must be in costume to be admitted to the skating floor. Winslow didn't miss a trick, however. He had arranged for a costume rental outfit to set up shop in the annex of the roller rink so that if anybody happened to be in Cottage City without a costume and wanted to go to the grand costume carnival at the roller skating rink and skate around dressed as George Washington or Napoleon or the Queen of Sheba or whoever else, um, they could doubtless for reasonable prices rent themselves a costume right there on premises. But skating wasn't just a participatory activity, a social activity, a chance to go out and spend some time with the person you'd like to get to know better while wheeling around the vast hardwood floor of the roller rink. It could also be a performative activity, a spectator activity. And you'll note that at the bottom of the card there, it mentions that there will be a double exp exhibition of scientific and acrobatic skating at nine o'clock by Mrs. Batty and Hacker. And I have no idea who Mrs. Batty and Hacker were, but I hereby declare that they win the most Dickensian names in today's presentation award. Next slide, please. The other side of the same card advertises other upcoming events at the rink. Polo, 
the costume carnival, polo again, a bicycle exhibition, and a fancy skating exhibition. Whether the polo was played on roller skates or bicycles is unclear. Either way, it would have been a novelty that would have drawn people to the skating rink to watch the exhibition and then perhaps skate themselves afterwards. Next slide, please. And then there's Professor Daniel James Canary, or Canary, depending on how he pronounced it, who on one Friday evening in July in the 1880s or early 1890s, gave an exhibition of fancy bicycle riding, accompanied by the beautiful little skater, Miss Bessie Coles and Miss Carrie Gilmore, the finest lady skater in America. The idea that roller skating and bicycling could be performative sports, could be something that you'd put down money to buy a ticket to go and watch, was a product of the late 19th century, when this kind of mass in-person entertainment was coming into its own, and when the advent of things like ball bearings and improved styles of bicycle were making it possible to do things with wheels underneath you on a smooth hardwood floor that would have been undreamt of even a decade earlier. Next slide, please. The roller skating rink came sadly to a bad end in 1892, when the Seaview Hotel that stood where the top of the Oak Bluff Steamship Authority Wharf is now burned down in September of 1892, <clears throat> embers blown from the burning hotel landed on the roof of the skating rink and partially destroyed it. It was torn down and replaced by a smaller venue called the Casino. But even at the Casino, Skating and skating exhibitions and bicycling exhibitions were still on offer through the 1890s and into the new century because there was still an overwhelming hunger for in-person, indoors mass entertainment involving wheels underneath your feet. Next slide, please. Bicycling didn't have to be indoors, of course, as these gentlemen from the 1880s demonstrate, you could, and people certainly did, ride their bicycles all over the island. Um, Oak Bluffs, Cottage City in those days, actively catered to participants in the emerging bicycle craze by paving over their downtown streets with concrete at a time when the downtown streets of Edgartown and Vineyard Haven were mostly dirt, crushed shells, and possibly a layer of tar to keep the dust down. Wheelmen, as they were called, bicycles were known colloquially as wheels. This one, the, the gentleman on the right is holding, gives an impression of why. Um, wheelmen flocked to Oak Bluffs, and you can read in the papers of that era, grumpy letters from people who were complaining about rowdy bicyclists going up and down the street at all hours, whooping and hollering and endangering pedestrians. If Islanders talk had existed then, doubtless there would have been any number of grumpy internet posts as well. But this was the 1880s and there was no internet. Um, and bicycles, by and large, looked like this one. The English would have called this a penny farthing. The technical term for it was an ordinary bicycle because it was the standard bicycle of the era. You'll note that the pedals are attached to the gigantic front wheel, driving the wheel directly, being attached to the axle itself, making it incredibly fast in the hands of a skilled rider, but an absolute nightmare to get on and off and prone to cause, if it encountered uneven ground, um, unexpected contact between the rider's skull and, the, and terra firma. 
You can imagine if you're perched on top of one of these things, why those concrete roads and oak bluffs would have looked really, really, really good to you. Smooth, if you're riding on a contraption like this, is an enormous selling point in a road. Next slide, please. If you were somewhat less daring, particularly if you were a woman, there were other options open to you. Again, gigantic drive wheels driven directly by hand or foot pedal cranks and a tiny steering wheel um, to guide the progress of the thing. Next slide, please. Or you could go for some kind of a hybrid number like this, which admittedly is a photograph that may not have been taken on the vineyard, although it's part of the Basil Welch collection. Basil Welch being somebody who was very much of the vineyard and collected a lot of antique photographs. If you see an antique photograph in one of our exhibits from the 1880s on down to the 1920s, chances are excellent that there may have come out of the Basil Welch collection. This vehicle, too, was an artifact of the 1880s, the early 1890s, but by the mid-1890s, next slide, please, bicycles had undergone a technological revolution. The gigantic direct drive front wheel and tiny back wheel had given Ray to what we would now, even today, 130 years on, look at and go, oh, yeah, it's a bicycle. Two basically equally sized wheels with pedals mounted to, to a crank in between them, driving the rear wheel through a sprocket and a chain drive. Safety bicycles, as they became known, were lower to the ground, easier to mount and dismount from, less of a threat to the continued integrity of your skull if you hit a bump in the road. There, you could put your feet down and stabilize the bicycle if you needed to. You wouldn't go pitching forward over the front wheel. Making them the first two-wheeled bicycles that were widely adopted by women as well as men and turning bicycling, which became a craze to end all crazes in the 1890s, into a co-ed form of physical recreation. The pearl-clutching, hand-wringing elements of society worried about what this would do to the delicate constitutions of the women who took up bicycling with such enthusiasm alongside men. But their fears turned out as usual to be unfounded. Bicycling, unlike yachting, unlike baseball, unlike rope, cut across lines of gender, lines of class, lines of race, lines of virtually every form of social division. It was among the most democratized of all forms of outdoor recreation. Next slide, please. And the vineyard, Oak Bluffs in particular, but the vineyard as a whole, was in the 1890s on down to the present day a hotbed of bicycling activity. You can see here the Overman Wheel Company operating in front of the newly moved flying horses in the early 1890s, where the Dukes County Savings Bank branch is now. And next slide. You have one of those rowdy gangs of bicyclists engaged in a race up Beach Street in Vineyard Haven, the five corners and the harbor at their back, heading for the mansion house, and then perhaps, we don't know, State Road and Points West. No bike path yet, but it was coming. Next slide, please. And so the beach, we started with the water and we'll wind up with the water. This is the waterfront, the beachfront in Oak Bluffs, just south of the corner of Ocean Park in about 1895. That tower behind the group in the foreground is an observation tower that was built at the corner of Seaview Drive and Ocean Avenue in about 1893. It's exactly what it sounds like. 
a chance to climb up to the top of the tower and get a bird's eye view of the sea, the park, the houses beyond. The structure behind the group posed on the sand there is one of the many, many, many rows of bathhouses that were built along the Oak Bluffs waterfront when beginning in the 1870s when Oak Bluffs became a popular summer resort. The idea of bathhouses was that you walk to them from your hotel or your cottage with your swimsuit, pardon me, bathing suit, more about that in a minute, in hand, changed out of your street clothes and into your, into your bathing costume, like the folks sitting on the sand there, and then walk down the stairs from the front of the bathhouse into the water. It would have been the height of a social faux pas, and indeed against local ordinances, to be seen on the street in your bathing costume. And a respectable person would no more have walked across Ocean Park in their bathing suit than they would have walked across Ocean Park stark naked. It was commonplace in those days for those who were going to the beach just to take in the social scene to not put on bathing costumes. Bathing costumes were something you put on if you were intending to actually put your body in the water, like the people in the front row there. If you were just going to the beach to go to the beach, to be on the beach, then you still wore your street clothes like the five women standing in the back row. And you can see to their left, as far as the picture goes, back under the bathhouses, there's a woman again in her street clothes, sitting on the sand in the shade of the bathhouses to avoid getting a tan. Tans being a mark of the working classes, farmers, laborers, fishermen, people who had to be outdoors all day in the sun to earn their living and a pale, smooth, skin being the mark of the well-to-do who, if they worked at all, worked in offices and out of the sun. If you went to the beach without the intention of going in the water, you wore your street clothes. If you were going in the water and you were a woman, you wore a dress that covered you from the neck to the ankle, stockings underneath that, and swimming shoes over the stockings. You're, depending on your particular taste, your dress might be long sleeved or it might be like the ones worn by, worn by the women here, have cap sleeves that left your forearms and part of your upper arms bare. Next slide, please. The men in that shot from the 1890s would have worn something like a suit of long underwear with three quarter length sleeves and three quarter length legs. By 1905, when this picture was taken, it was the same rig for the women. Although notice that the girl second from left is not wearing stockings. More advances in swimwear virtually always start with the young and work their way up through the generations. The men you'll notice have moved away, at least the guy on the far right has moved away from a one piece rig to a separate top and bottom. Although like the guy on the left with the luxuriant mustache, his chest is still covered even though his arms are mostly uncovered. Next slide, please. Here we are maybe five years later the two-piece look is taken over for guys. The woman's still covered from neck to ankle. That is a swimming costume she's wearing. You can see one like it again in the One Island Many Stories exhibit. Next slide, please. And now we're into about 1922. The guys' trunks have gotten shorter. The women, the two on the left anyway, are no longer wearing stockings or shoes nor do they have sleeves. And their, their bathing dresses have a V-neck that exposes the neck and the upper chest. Next slide, please. 
And now we're, I would guess, immediately after World War II. The man's wearing a pair of belted trunks, his torso's uncovered, and nobody's particularly startled by the fact. The women have moved away from baggy bathing dresses towards more form-fitting suits. The bottom halves of their suits have what would now be called boy, a boy leg cut, but most of their thighs are exposed and the suit itself is significantly more form-fitting. Their arms are completely bare. And if you look at the woman on the left, so, is, so are her shoulders and her back. Next slide, please. In this postcard from the 1960s, the suits have again gotten shorter. The men's suits have lost their belts. The women's suits are roughly what they were in the late 1940s. But note that both of the women pictured are well into middle age. A teenage girl in this same scene, say two feet off to the left and out of frame, would, next slide please, very likely have been wearing something like the young woman standing on the far left of this shot, a relatively brief two-piece that exposes, exposes her midriffs cut high on her thighs and dips low enough in the front to expose her cleavage. Now, on one hand, this sounds like the same old boring story of yes, time marches on, and things evolve in a straightforward linear pattern as social norms change. People get less and less prudish, people get more and more accepting of nudity and so on and so forth, except, and that's true to a degree, but it misses two things. One is that Nudity in swimming was in the 19th century perfectly normal. If you were male and doing it at the local lake, the local pond, the local swimming hole, it was when swimming became a public activity in, done in public spaces like the beaches or summer resorts like Oak Bluffs and Edgartown that the idea of having a distinctive costume in which you had to wear to keep yourself properly and decently covered so that you could go into the water became a thing. The shift in swimming costumes was not from near total coverage to near complete nudity. It was from actual nudity to near complete coverage to over the course of a century or so. Not nudity, but a significant degree of exposure. Next slide, please. Which is not to say that people who went to the beach for the, ver for the purposes of exposing their bodies to the sun and getting themselves a tan didn't take it the next step beyond in some secluded parts of the vineyard. I include this not because it's directly related to swimming, but to make two very quick observations. One, this is a photochrome mass-produced postcard from the 1960s with two absolutely unequivocally naked people on it. And two, which is something you would not, in point of fact, expect to see in the still relatively prudish about nudity 1960s. And yet, it's also nudity of the sort that you used to see in the 40s and 50s in National Geographic magazine in full color photos of this or that or the other, quote, primitive, unquote, society in some far flung corner of the world. The extraordinary thing about this, the only postcard in the thousands of postcards in our collection that casually and un unashamedly depicts two completely nude people is that it treats them, I would argue, like members of an exotic 
foreign culture. Here on Martha's Vineyard on the beaches of Gay Head live a strange group of people called hippies who sometimes lay on the beach with no clothes on. It's that distancing that made it would feel legitimate to sell a picture like this in a souvenir shop on the vineyard in the 1960s. But next slide, please. Next slide, please. The evolution of the swimsuit is partly about evolving attitudes towards nudity and where it was legitimate to expose some or part or all of your skin and which parts it was legitimate to expose. It was also about what you did once you were in the water. This picture from about 1900, taken off Oak Bluffs again, is standard issue what people did in the water at the turn of the last century. You waded in, you stood around, you splashed water on yourself, you waded out again. Swimming as we know it, jump off the dock, paddle around, virtually unknown among the beachgoers of late 19th, early 20th century Martha's Vineyard. Next slide, please. By the 1930s, it had begun to shift. It was no longer bathing, standing in the water up to your waist, maybe up to your shoulders, splashing water on yourself, talking to your neighbor, that people went to the beach to do. It was actual what we'd recognize as swimming, paddling around, diving, jumping. Note on the end of the dock there, where the red arrows are pointing, a diving board, a water slide, a pair of rings designed so that you could hang from them, swing, let go, fall in the water, a raft that you could swim out to and dive off of. The water would have been over those people's heads that are standing on the raft under the left-hand arrow. By the 1930s, actual physical movement in the water involving all four of your limbs and your whole body was becoming a widely practiced form of recreation. And if you're gonna do that, as opposed to if you're going to stand around up to your waist or your knees or whatever and splash water on yourself, but basically stay upright and stay put. Once you start to get more athletic, you need a closer fitting, briefer suit that moves with you rather than billowing around you and weighing you down and interfering with your ability to move your limbs. Next slide, please. And well, if you're gonna do something like jump off big bridge on the Edgartown Vineyard Haven, Edgartown Oak Bluffs line, then you not only need a suit that'll move with you once you're swimming around in the water, but that will stay attached to you when you hit the water and surface again to swim to the bank to do it again. It's a gray cold day here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum, but I'm gonna end with that image as a reminder that summer is coming. And I hope we all get a chance to get out and enjoy the sun and the sand and the wind and the water. Thank you everybody. And if we have any questions, it seems as though we have one rather, rather detailed question. A Reverend John W. Dorney of the campground had a Menemsha in the 1950s and 60s that had been fitted with an inboard motor. Was that common for that class? Absolutely not. I honestly have never heard of a Menemsha fitted with an inboard motor. And I tip my hat in absentia to Reverend Doherty for figuring out how the heck you would even do that on a Menemsha, which was not known for its enormous amount of below deck space in which to put a motor. So Reverend, congratulations. You had a one of a kind vessel. Excellent. 
I believe that is our only remaining question. So I would really like to thank everybody for tuning in today to Hidden Collections. And I hope very much that you will join us again for the season finale. We'll be wrapping up for the spring next month, Wednesday, May 4th at 1230, as always. And Bo will regale us once again with uh, the unseen parts of our archives. Thank you again for coming and we will see you soon. Mm -hmm.